Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we survey your cross today, on this Good Friday, as we see the events of Good Friday unfolding, we ask that just now, as we open your word, you will speak to us, that we will respond to all that you have done for us. Amen. Amen. I wonder if you have a cross in your home somewhere. One of the benefits of meeting on Zoom over the last 12 months is that we've got to look inside each other's houses, perhaps in ways in which we wouldn't have done normally. And I can think of at least one couple uh, at Basingstoke who have a cross that quite often appears on a display behind them. Uh, when they're joining on Zoom. So perhaps you have a cross like this one uh, or something similar in your home. Or perhaps you wear one. Perhaps you wear a lapel pin like I do or maybe you wear one around your neck. Perhaps you have one in your pocket. Several years ago it was popular to have a cross in my pocket that uh, when you put your hands in your pocket just reminds you of the cross of Jesus. Or perhaps you have one on a card that you keep in your purse or your wallet or in the back of your Bible or songbook to remind you of Good Friday. When you see a cross, whether you see one at home or whether you see one when you're out and about, perhaps on a church or somewhere else, do you ever think about how scandalous it is that the Christian faith chose the cross as the symbol of its faith? The cross is an instrument of Roman torture, perhaps the the worst kind of execution and torture that humanity has ever thought of. It's a picture of empire dominance, of, of dictatorship, of authority over one human being, of putting human beings into submission. It's scandalous that Christians would choose the cross as a symbol of their faith. If Christianity was to start today, then the equivalent would be to choose, I don't know, uh, gallows as the symbol of our faith, an electric chair, the gas chamber, an AK-47, that's how scandalous it is for Christians to choose the cross as a symbol of their faith. Over the past few weeks, if you've joined with us, we've been thinking about God's scandalous love and we've thought a couple of times about how the cross was a scandal. Paul says it himself when he writes to the Corinthians. What a scandal the cross is. The message of the cross is foolish, it's scandalous to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Paul says it was scandalous to the Jews who could not believe that God's anointed one, God's Messiah, would be executed on an instrument of Roman torture and death. Scandalous. The Greeks, in all their wisdom, said no God would ever come down, become a human being, and then let humanity treat him the way that Jesus let himself be treated. Scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. But there's more. There's more. Jesus understood his death on a cross would be scandalous. That first passage that we heard this morning in verse 31, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus tells his disciples, tonight all of you will desert me, for the scriptures say God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now, 
The Greek word for desert me or some Bibles have fall away from me or run away and leave me is the Greek word skandalizo. The root of that word is where we get our word scandal from. In other words, Jesus is saying, tonight all of you will be scandalized by what I'm about to do. You'll fall away, you will desert me, you will run away and leave me. You will be scandalized by what is about to happen. And let's face it, when you stop to think about the events of Good Friday, it is a scandal. It's a scandal that the Son of God, God the Son, will be treated in the way that he was treated. It's a scandal that his followers would desert him. It's a scandal that one of his followers would betray him. It's a scandal that the Jewish authorities decided to make him a political scapegoat. It's a scandal that they spat upon him. It's a scandal that the Son of God would be dragged before Pilate, who would wash his hands of him and hand him over to be crucified. It's a scandal that that Jerusalem crowd who just a few days ago was shouting Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would turn on him and shout, crucify him. It's a scandal that the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, would strip him and mock him and spit on him, place a crown of thorns on his head, beat him to within an inch of his life and then make him carry a heavy wooden cross through the streets of Jerusalem. It's a scandal that the Son of God was laid on the floor and his arms outstretched and his hands and his feet nailed to a piece of wood. It's a scandal that that piece of wood was then raised from the ground so that people could come and look upon the spectacle of the Son of God executed on a cross in excruciating pain. It's a scandal that the soldiers divided up his clothes by lot. It's a scandal that the people of Jerusalem and the religious leaders came past as he was dying and abused and spat on him once more. It's a scandal that the Son of God would be treated in that way. But it's a scandal too because of why he did it. He said he was going to the cross for you and for me for his followers. Let me ask you a question, a nice easy question on a Good Friday. Which disciple was it that denied Jesus? Now if you were here in the hall this morning I would ask you that question and you could put your hand up uh, or shout out the answer, but you're not. So I'm going to ask the one person who is in the hall this morning who suddenly shot up in her chair, which disciple was it who denied Jesus? Gail says it was Peter. Was that your answer? That it was Peter who denied Jesus? Well, is that really the answer to the question? Because Jesus prophesied that all of his disciples would deny and desert him. That verse 31 says, Tonight all of you will desert me. All of you will be scandalized by what I am about to do for you. And the sad conclusion to that prophecy comes in verse 56. Jesus says, all this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. And then perhaps the saddest words, certainly of the Thursday night. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. The scandal is that Jesus died for all those disciples who deserted him and denied 
ever knowing him. It's a scandal that Jesus died for Judas, who betrayed him, him and then, in remorse, killed himself. Jesus died for Judas. It's a scandal that Jesus died for the Jewish council who mocked him and, and found whatever evidence they could, made up evidence in order to convict him of the crimes they accused him of. But Jesus died for them to give them an opportunity to reconnect with God. They were the people of God. They were the leaders of the people of God. They were the shepherds of the people of God. And they'd lost contact with God. It was a scandal that Jesus died for Pilate, the occupying Roman governor, the one who washed his hands of him and simply handed him over to the crowd and to the Jewish authorities for the want of political expediency. It was a scandal that Jesus died for Pilate so that he might find the truth that they spoke about in his chambers. It's a scandal that Jesus died for Barabbas, who on that first Good Friday found his physical freedom released from bondage, from prison, but so that he might find his spiritual freedom too. It's a scandal that Jesus died for that crowd who turned on him in, what, the space of four or five days and cried for him to be crucified. He died for them that they might find their way back to God. It's a scandal that Jesus died and went to the cross for the soldiers who mocked him and spat on him and whipped him to an inch of his life and nailed him to that cross. And we're told that the Roman centurion at the cross said, surely this man is the Son of God. That's why Jesus died. It's a scandal that Jesus died for me. Someone who still makes mistakes. Who still betrays him in thought, word and deed on occasions. Who lets him down. It's a scandal that Jesus died for me. It's a scandal that Jesus died for you. We saw those words a little earlier in our meeting. The scandal is that whilst we were still sinners, Jesus died for you and for me. Jesus died for everyone, everyone you come into contact with today. He died for them. This was a scandal, a scandal of the crucified Messiah. It baffled his followers. It disappointed the crowds. It enraged the political and religious leaders of the time. But the scandal is that Jesus comes as our saviour, as the stricken and slain Messiah, and delivers us from sin and evil in the world and in our own lives. He comes to us as the sacrificial servant who's willing to spled, spill his blood for our humanity to bear the sins of humanity. He comes as the scandal of our willing Lord who willingly goes to the cross and somehow remains in control of events because he's following his Father's will and willingly dies in our place. It's the scandal of our humble king who comes from a poor Bethlehem stable to humiliation on the cross, bringing the redemption of humanity. So what is our response to this scandal? 
The world's response is to believe it doesn't need the cross. Today on this Good Friday, certainly in the United Kingdom, it's a public holiday and hundreds of thousands, millions of people will pass the symbol of a cross and not give it a second thought. The world doesn't think that it needs the cross. It's rejected as a scandal that's not even worth thinking about. But before we get too judgmental, Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, didn't think that he needed the cross either. Peter's response to Jesus' prophecy that all of them would be scandalized by what was about to happen, would desert him, was to say in verse 33, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Even if everyone else is scandalized by what is about to happen, then I will not be scandalized, I will stand firm. What is Peter saying here? Peter is saying as perhaps some Christians do today, I can live the victorious Christian life without the cross. I can live the life of a Christ follower without the power of his resurrection in my life. Peter had such great faith in his faith that he didn't need what was about to happen to Jesus. Who needs the cross says Peter, when you have such great faith like mine. But again, before we condemn Peter, have a look at our passage. Because all his followers said the same. They all followed up on what Peter said. We're not going to desert you. We have great faith in our faith. But we know what happened to Peter. He did need the cross. In verse 75, after he's denied Peter, uh, Jesus three times, after he's heard the rooster crow and remembers what Jesus said to him, it says he went away weeping bitterly. And in the Gospel of Matthew, That's Peter's epitaph. Douglas O'Donnell says, that verse, verse 75, is the last word on Peter in the Gospel of Matthew. No more talking from Peter, no more great confessions, no more boasting, no more walking on water, no more drawing his sword. There is only silence. And the unmistakable noise of someone scampering in the dark and the faint sound of a once mighty man crying in the night. There is only silence until the resurrection and the Great Commission when Peter will hear the words from Jesus. I am with you always. Let's not fall into Peter's trap of having great faith in our faith. And believing that we can live the Christian life without the cross, without the victorious power of the resurrection. Maybe our response as we look at the cross today should be to stop talking. Should be to stop making great promises to God of what we're going to do on his behalf to stop boasting in our faith and the way that we live our lives, to stop trying to walk on water, to to stop trying to fight Jesus' battles for him, but to look at the cross in silence and to realise that we need the cross now more than ever. We're tainted by sin. Our human nature, our natural response, our natural instinct is to be selfish, is to go after the wrong thing rather than the right thing. 
We all fail at times. We all make mistakes. We all make huge promises to God that we can never fulfill. We all deny him with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. But in the cross, we can find God's forgiveness again. In the cross, we find that God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's mercy far surpasses our sin, far surpasses our guilt and our shame. The cross is bigger than our failures. God is always ready to start afresh with us. It is never too late for God. The cross can strengthen our faith. The good news of this message is that even as Jesus predicted that all of his followers would be scandalized by what was about to happen on Good Friday, that even though each one of them would desert him and flee from him, he had already decided to forgive them. Immediately after he makes that prophecy, he says in verse 32 of Matthew 26, But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Jesus says, I already know what you're going to do. You're going to be scandalized by what's about to happen. You're going to desert me. You're going to flee from me. You're going to hide behind locked doors in fear for your life. But I have already decided to forgive you and I will meet you in Galilee after I've been raised from the dead. Jesus says to you and me this morning, I know what you've done. I know what you're going to do in the future, however hard you try to live the life of Christian faith. But I've already decided to forgive you. Come to me. Come to the cross. Find the forgiveness that you need. Find the love that you need. Find the salvation that you need. Find the light that you need. Perhaps our only proper response as we look at the cross today in silence is simply to say in our hearts, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Once again, I look upon that cross where you died. I'm humbled by your most mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. Will you thank God for the scandal of the cross today? as we sing these words together. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death many times. I've wondered at your gift of life I'm in that place once again I'm in that place once again And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy And I'm broken inside Once again I thank you once again I pour out my life Now you are exalted to the highest place King of the heavens Where one day I'll bow But for
Lord now I marvel at your saving grace I'm full of praise once again I'm full of praise once again And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life And once again I look upon the cross where you Once again I pour out my life 